started with our Sunday school hour number 223, Springs of Living Water. Let's all stand as we get started, number 223. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul is satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. This is number 223. We'll go to Lake right to that last stanza. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? The fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, now am I, my soul is satisfied, drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Excellent singing. Please be seated. Come on up here, boys and girls. We're going to sing a song. We're going to sing in and right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Very simple song. We can all do this. We're going to do pointer finger ones because that's easier than jumping around. In right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Did you get a haircut? Yeah. Looking sharp, man. Hey, Ho oh, Clayton, how's it going? All right, you ready? You got pointer fingers? Okay, here we go. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in and cleansed my heart from sin, I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Excellent. All right. We're going to do it a little bit faster this time. You ever ready? Point your fingers. Here we go. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in, and cleanse my heart from sin. You ready now? I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Excellent singing. Very nice. Well done. Spectacular. Not too bad either. All right. See you later, guys and gals. Head on down to Sunday school. Enjoy. So nice to see you all this morning. Gonna be a blistering hot day today. So nice to have air conditioning here at New Testament Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. So we have a brand new outline, starting a brand new series. We've been, of course, over these last I don't know, a couple of years now, doing series on uh, doctrine. We spent a year and a few months doing eschatology, end time things. We spent the last, I don't know, six months or so uh, talking about bibliology, the doctrine of the Bible, and now we're getting started on a series on ecclesiology, and that's the doctrine of the church. This will probably be the last, I don't know, maybe three or four months, if that, and um, we have other doctrinal uh, studies we're going to be doing, so um, this all premises on that verse of Scripture from uh, 1 Timothy 4, which says, uh, uh, till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. And so we've been just focusing on some of the primary doctrines in the Bible. Um, so uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the Gospel of Matthew this morning as we get started. Matthew chapter 16. And that's where we're going to start at as far as in our Bible. But we, you can see in our outline we've got a lot of things we want to talk about this morning as far as um, uh, ecclesiology. And so once you get an outline, but uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to be talking about uh, eschatology, or excuse me, ecclesiology this morning, doctrine of the church. 
I'm going to be starting verse number 13 of this portion of Scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. The Lord Jesus Christ has taken His apostles kind of aside for a little bit. They went up to, um, went up to um, um, uh, Caesarea Philippi, a little further north there on the Syrian, uh, up towards Syria and Syrian border, that direction. When Jesus uh, came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do... Men say that the Son of Man am, and so we're, this is, we're getting started with Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others uh, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We'll stop right there, have a word of prayer, uh, make some comments about this, and then move along with our outline in reference to this getting started with our series on ecclesiology. Let's pray. Father... I want to thank you, Lord. It's good to be in your house today. And I ask you, Lord, as uh, we begin this study uh, on this great subject of the church, I pray, Father, you would bless, help us all to understand uh, the practical application of your word, not only in our personal lives, but also especially in the life of this church, uh, that we would be uh, patterned after the Old Testament, uh, uh, the old uh, ways of doing things that we see in the early church in that first century. We'd pattern our lives against uh, the scriptures, and Father, that our church uh, would be a church that reflects not only the truth of the Word of God, but also reflects your glory. And I pray, Father, you guide us in all truth today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody have an outline? Do we have outlines left? Yes. If we have a few left. If you need an outline, make sure you just pop your head. we got a couple coming in, and we have a few left, and... Uh, all righty. So um, this particular portion of Scripture, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ makes that great statement in verse number 18. Uh, and he says, uh, he says, upon this rock I will build my church. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, over the next several weeks. And that is uh, the church itself. What, is it, what do we mean by church? What is the church? And so very important subject matter, especially since we're meeting in a church today. Um, and so we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's important to understand what the Bible says about what we are as compared to just using definitions that people contrive or have developed over the years. And so that's what we're going to spend our time. Just a couple comments about this portion of Scripture before we move on from here. Uh, verse number 18, of course, uh, Peter is talking. The word, the, Peter's name, of course, means a stone. And so Jesus says, not, a, not upon Peter. The church is not built upon Peter. Of course, I was raised believing that Peter was the rock that the church was built upon, but that is not the case. The scripture is not building the church upon a, an individual person. He said, he said, thou art Peter, thou art a stone, and upon this rock, and he's talking about is this profession of faith that Peter had expressed, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And um, this profession of faith in the acceptance of who Jesus Christ is, is the foundational stone by which the church is built upon. It is built upon, um, it is built with those that have made this profession of faith. We're not brought into uh, the Lord's church simply by being born into it. We're going to talk about that weeks from now. Uh, we're not brought into the church simply because, well, everybody's, you know, uh, uh, that is, you know, raised going to church as a part of the Lord's church. That, that's not how we're brought into it. It is, we're brought in by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, scriptural baptism, and then added unto the church. And these are the things we'll be talking about weeks from now. But for this morning, what we're going to do is basically defining our terms. And so that's so important. Please notice in your outline here that ecclesiology is the study of the church. And there's a lot of misconceptions about that. And, we all, and, and this is one of the first one, of course, is, is talking about the building itself. I do this all the time. So do you. You know, I'll see you, I'll see you at church. See, it, you know, and, and so we often refer to the building as the church, and certainly, you know, I guess there's nothing wrong with it, but if you want to get technical, this is not the church. It's not a, uh, I, I often find myself trying to use terms like church building, see, at the church building, 
um, just to kind of get over that misconception of what the church is, but uh, I think we all know that we all do that, and we all know what we mean when we do that. So um, just, just, I just wanted to put that right out front there. Um, the use of, of the term church in reference to a denomination uh, is, all, is often used, okay? For instance, you know, Presbyterian Church USA, that's a denomination. Uh, I, was, I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and that is a, that's a denomination. Uh, and so a lot of times when people use the term church, they're speaking about a large, often mostly global organization, and they use the term church to um, kind of throw that whole thing in there. It's a global collection of Christians under some kind of single umbrella, and they use the term church. The, um, the next one I have on the list here about doing church um, a lot of times folks use the term church in reference to what people do. So um, I, just as an example, I'm just pulling from my own experience. Uh, many years ago, I was out visiting our good friends, the Ambroses, out in the Pittsburgh area, Zealian Opal, you know, the mega, comp, mega uh, urban complex of Zealian Opal in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And uh, we were out at some park. Matter of fact, uh, Brother Andy and I, were we were uh, metal detecting at a park. And so uh, there was a group of folks over there. I heard a little bit of ruckus going on, music and singing and stuff. So I had to go investigate. And uh, I, I see these young folks out there, and they're just playing their guitars and singing. I said, what are you guys up to? Oh, he said, we're, we're you know, we're, I don't even know what group they were from. They mentioned some kind of uh, non-denominational type of uh, organization. And he said, he said we're just, we're just kind of like doing church a new way. And I'm thinking, what a, <laughs> okay. I didn't know we needed a new way of doing church. And so for them, church is, is what you do. You know, you have a, um, you know, a service at, or a gathering or some kind of thing. And to them, you know, um, that, that was just, that's church. Um, I mean, certainly churches do things, but the church is not just the action of, for instance, getting together and playing a guitar or trying to worship or whatever. That, that's, not, that's not what the church is. Um, I, I want you to notice the, the fourth thing I have on that list there. Many will add terms like universal and invisible. We're going to be talking about these things. This is a very important part of understanding the doctrine of what the church is. Um, I'll, I mean, full disclosure, okay, for myself personally, when the church that I got saved in was a, um, uh, a, there in Claymont, Delaware, um, we had gone through a gob of pastors while I was there. I was in that church for eight years, got saved at 19 years old, and of course we left there and went off to Bible college. And during that period of time, we would, I think we went through, if I'm remembering correctly, six different pastors in eight years, which is not a good thing, okay? Um, the, uh, the original pastor that was there when I was there, I believe he was a Bob Jones graduate. Uh, we had pastors there that had been uh, parts of uh, the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. And that's, of course, that's why they said, go to Springfield, young man, when you start talking about the fact you've been called to the ministry. Um, we had other fellows that were associated with like Tennessee Temple, those organizations. And so you could imagine the, the plethora of doctrinal positions that I was exposed to. And so um, as far as what the church was, I had not a clue as far as understanding what is, what is a church. Um, the early stuff that I was reading, and I've told you this many times, I was a big fan of Charles Rory and his books. I still, I, honestly, I still like his books. He's, he's very easy to read, but doctrinally, he is not where I am. He's Presbyterian in his background. Uh, taught a lot of folks at, uh, at the college over there in Philadelphia. I'm not sure what the name of the college is nowadays. It used to be Philadelphia College of the Bible. Uh, written a lot of books, a lot of study Bibles, things like that. So I, my understanding of what the church was was based on the writings of Dr. Charles Rory. And, uh, of course, I never knew any different or any better. So I, was, I, I cut my teeth on that type of doctrine, which is Presbyterian in its background, and so my understanding of the church was the fact that it was a universal, invisible church. And I didn't have anybody tell me otherwise. Uh, and so, and I didn't, I didn't realize it was even an issue. I didn't even think there was an alternative. 
uh, coming out of Roman Catholicism like I did, and we're going to talk about all these distinctions weeks from now, but the Roman Catholic Church believes in a universal, visible church. They are the kingdom of God. They are the church, and they are visibly present around the world, and they are going to expand that church until they're amillennial. We'll talk about that a little bit too. But they're, they're going to expand the church until finally the kingdom of God comes in. And so they are the kingdom of God. They are a universal church. And so that's the kind of doctrinal background I had as far as Catholicism. And then coming in after I got saved and being exposed to a lot of Presbyterian doctrine in the, in, in the Baptist church that I was in. And so my understanding of the church was very corrupt until I met um, Pastor Leon Gray, uh, my pastor uh, from back there in Springfield, who just preached a very simple message on a Wednesday night. And I sat back and said, man, I'd never heard this stuff before. <laughs> and Brother Gray was just, I've shared this many times, just very simple. He was, you know, very simple in his teaching. He's like, just sit back, Brother Chuck, and just listen. And I did, and it changed everything as far as my understanding, not only of the church, but everything as far as my understanding of, of the direction of my ministry. It changed everything. Your understanding of the essence of what the church is affects the practical application of not only many doctrines, but the practice of the church itself. What we do as a church is defined by what we believe the church is. You cannot separate the two. And so getting a good understanding of what the church is really defines your, our function as a ministry. And so that all changed um, there in Springfield. Uh, I didn't intend for that. I was going to a, a, a college out there uh, part of the Baptist Bible Fellowship International um, organization. It's a, not a, they don't call themselves a denomination, but that's what they are. They're a fellowship of churches. Um, but, uh, you know, universal church in their background. Actually, two churches, we'll talk about that also. Um, but uh, just a real mix of different backgrounds and understandings. They've, they've turned extremely liberal. There's parts that have splintered off of that. That's where I was going to go to school at. That's my background. That's what I was going to pursue. My understanding of what the church is in a Protestant, by basically Protestant doctrine, that was going to be sufficient to, to do very well for me. Uh, and then I heard something else, and then everything changed. So um, I, I just, speaking for myself in a very personal and practical way, my understanding of what the church is changed everything about my ministry. And I don't say that to try to, there's no exaggeration there at all. It changed everything. So for me, church doctrine is extremely important. So understanding what the church is. Now the terms like universal and visible, we're going to define those terms weeks from now. But the understanding of, uh, that the church is a universal and visible church is the position of many, I would say this, Practically all, uh, all um, Protestants, Baptists are not Protestants, by the way, practically all Protestants would believe in a universal invisible church. And many Baptists, because of the influence of Protestantism in many Baptist circles, have bought into the universal invisible church doctrine also. So they've kind of taken a step down from being independent Baptist to simply being, you know, Protestant Baptist, if you could even use that term. And, and so um, universal and visible plays a key part of that in many churches today and many Baptist churches. So um, we'll, we're certainly going to talk about and define a lot of terms. The, uh, the Bible word church, and please right there in the outline, I know we're just kind of stepping through it here, uh, comes from, and there's the word ekklesia, that's there's the Greek, and that's the you know the pronunciation of it there. That's the word itself. If back in our text there in Matthew chapter 16, uh, and upon this rock, uh, in verse number 18, he said, "I will build my church, ecclesia. I will build my ecclesia." That word itself is used, if I'm remembering correctly, 117 times in the New Testament. Um, the majority of times, 
It is going to be translated church. We'll talk about that in just a moment here. Um, Ecclesia is a compound word. And we're just, we're, all we're doing, we're defining terms here, right? That's what we're doing. Uh, ecclesia, ek, and that uh, in, in Greek, the word, uh, that term ek uh, means out or out of or from. You, you get the idea, okay? Um, klesi, um, um, kaleo is the, is the second part of that. Uh, you've heard me say this many times. A lot of Greek words are compound words. They just kind of put things together. Paul is really good at that in his writing, just kind of sticking words together to get uh, other words. But this is a very common word in the first century, ekklesia. Um, kaleo means to call. So the basic meaning is call out of. Ekklesia. So you have, you have this calling it. So we have this group of people here. You call out some particular ones out of that group. And you have an ecclesia, a called out. Often the word assembly is added in there, and that's the idea of calling it out in order to assemble people together. Ecclesia, called out assembly is often how it's described. Jesus said, Upon this rock, and I've got the text there, I will build my church. Ecclesia. Now, ecclesia is translated as church or churches everywhere in the New Testament, um, as I mentioned, with the exception. Uh, of of uh, Acts chapter 19. So if you would please turn to Acts chapter 19. And so this is Paul the Apostle. He is in the city of Ephesus. Uh, we've been studying, of course, in the, uh, on Thursday nights, going through the book of Acts and talking about the early church and talking about missions work and talking about evangelism. Uh, and so we've been through Acts chapter 19 just a few months ago as we've been progressing through the book of Acts. And you'll see, of course, Paul is preaching there. Folks are getting a little perturbed by his preaching, especially this fellow, um, this uh, silversmith. He'll, he's mentioned here in verse number 24, there's a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines of Diana. You'll see that in 1924. And so, um, so you have this guy getting upset. He just kind of gets everybody on the ball as far as being upset against the preaching of the gospel because all he cares about, of course, is selling his silver shrines and his business. It's kind of like, you know, the uh, preachers from uh, many decades ago that were preaching against alcohol and sale of alcohol and liquor, liquor stores and bars were shutting down and folks are just in and up our Billy Sunday. That was like notorious time period, you know, with his preaching and, uh, and others that were preaching during that period of time. And, you know, when the liquor stores start shutting down, folks start getting upset, you know, and uh, they, they get in an uproar. That's exactly what's happening here. And um, they're in jeopardy of losing their business because folks are saying, oh, my, you mean God is not made with hands? We, should, we don't need to buy silver. We don't need to buy statues to remind us of God. And, and so there is a riot somewhat that breaks out. Folks are running to the, uh, the amphitheater. If you went to Ephesus today, the ruins of Ephesus are still there, uh, including the amphitheater uh, that is mentioned here. So they, they ran together um, and uh, began to have this tremendous uproar. And I'm going to drop down. Uh, you notice in our text here, verse number 29, the whole city this is uh, 1929 in the book of Acts. The whole city was filled with confusion, having caught Gaius and our, um, uh, Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. They rushed with one accord into the theater. And, and so we, we see this gathering together of folks. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure into the theater. Verse number 32, some therefore cried out um, and some others for the, please notice what it says here, for the assembly was confused and the more part uh, knew not uh, wherefore they were come together. Now I read that whole thing there just to kind of get the background as far as this big group of people all coming together and just screaming and yelling. As a matter of fact, they're going to go on for hours. You know, great is Diana of Ephesus. And was, you'll notice in, uh, there in verse number 32 the word assembly that's used for the assembly, ecclesia. So the word ecclesia is translated church or churches 
uh, in the majority going through the New Testament. Like I said, I think it's 117 times it's used. And then you have things like this, where ecclesia, this is, this is, in a, um, this is in, being used in a secular way and being used in reference to this group of folks that are coming out uh, in order in protest against Paul and his folks, um, and the word assembly is used. I, I would, if you please, um, I'm going to drop down a little bit further, and you'll notice in your outline, verse number, um, uh, verse number twenty. I'm sorry, thirty-eight. Um, wherefore, if uh, Demetrius, uh, and this this is one of the fellows. This is um, a guy that had gotten up. He is the uh, kind of the town clerk, uh, trying to appease everyone. Uh, and so he's just making these statements. If Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and they are deputies, let them uh, implead uh, one another. But if ye require anything concerning other matters, it, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly, ecclesia. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to read down to the end of the uh, chapter here. For you're in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we uh, may give an account of this uh, concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. And so here, here we just get a glimpse, just a little bit, of, uh, of how, a, how the word ecclesia was understood in the first century. Now, please, please be reminded of the fact when, when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church, he didn't create a new word. He didn't come up with something brand new. This was a, this, this was a term that was extremely familiar in the first century when Jesus used it. And, and so uh, if, if he would have used that term to his disciples, they, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Talking about a gathering of people. I will, I will build my church, my ecclesia. Now, please notice, I'm, I'm just, again, I'm just looking at the first, you know, this first century use of the word, and I'm looking at how people would have understood it. The, the town clerk here, he makes, he makes this point saying, listen, there's, there's a way of doing it right, and there's a way of doing it wrong. He uses the term lawful assembly. In other words, can you, can you have an assembly that's not lawful? I'm just asking, can you have an assembly? Sure. Yeah. If he says, you know, we need to have a lawful assembly, then, that, then the assemblies can be unlawful. In other words, you can have, you can, I'm just throwing the word out here that we use today, church. You can have a lawful church and an unlawful church. You can do things the right way or you can do things the wrong way. So they would have understood. Now, during the first century, of course, the Romans... This was a Roman world. It used to be a Greek world. Um, Romans took over from the Greeks. They had established a lot, of, um, a lot of control, lots of different ways, primarily with their army. But they also, in certain provinces, they allowed folks to do their own thing, have their own business, conduct their own, um, conduct their own assemblies. So, for instance, um, you know, I, uh, I used to be living there in Pemberton Borough. Okay, we sold our house last year, so I'm, you know, not, not a resident of Pemberton Borough anymore. Um, leading up to our, our sale of our house there in Pemberton, we were extremely concerned about the house that was next door to us. You know, the one that was falling down that had, you know, rotted beams in the house was like, ah! literally, I was waiting for it to just kind of slide over into our property and, um, you know, take out our rose bush or something, you know. Um, so we started going, uh, I wrote a, wrote a really tactful letter to the city council. Um, I try to be tactful. Tact is the ability of making a point without making an enemy. I read that somewhere at one time. And so um, uh, that started the ball. You know that quote? Do you know who said that? No, but that's a good one. That's a good one. Thanks. All right. I, I didn't write that originally, but you can write that down. You can use it. All right. Quote me. All right. Um, the... Um, Actually, there was, uh, I think it was Isaac Newton that actually said that. You have to look that one up. All right. Um, the, uh, the city council got my letter, read it at the council meeting. 
uh, that we were still doing the Skype meeting, so I was Skyping in on every meeting that came after that, and every time we had a meeting, I would, you know, it's now the public section of our meeting. Would someone like to say something? They'd read through the list of all the public that had signed up for the meeting. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'd like to say a few things. How's the progress doing on this property that's next door to us? It's about ready to fall down. And, uh, and so we, we just kept pushing the button until somebody said, let's do something with this. And, well, you've, if you drive through the borough, you know they did something with it. So thankfully. But... Um, no, well, they were going to. Actually, the town, the town actually bought the property. Um, they, they, oh, I, I mean, it's a long story, but they, yeah, the guy that owned it owned taxes, owned back taxes, owned back utility bills. They, they you know, basically threatened him, saying, hey, you need to do something with this. So they, they took the property from him and forgave him of all his indebtedness to the borough. They were going to tear the property down, and then, some, uh, then a, a, a developer stepped in and said, I can fix this, and he did. He did a great job. They sold the property to him at an extremely low amount, and he fixed it up and sold it for a gob of money, and everybody was happy. So um, it worked out really well. But it started with a called-out assembly. <laughs> it started at a council meeting. I, was a, I, I lived in Pemberton Borough. I had the legal right to be there and express my opinion, and it was a lawful assembly. And had a purpose, and everything got done, and I'm happy. I don't live in Pemberton Borough anymore. And so, I, I mean, I suppose I could show up at one of their meetings in the, uh, now, but I have no right, no say. You know, I might, you know, they might respect my opinion about something. Who knows? Uh, but um, I'm not a part of that assembly anymore because I don't live there. And so, in the first century, that's exactly how they would have understood the word ecclesia. So when you had a community, like for instance, Ephesus, that was a big city. It was one of the largest cities in the Roman, and on the Mediterranean Roman world. Um, so when they had a gathering together, it was of the citizens of that. And there were particular criteria. You know, there were certain folks that could, be, could exercise their opinion or vote, and others that, that could not. And the town clerk said, listen, if we want to do this, it's got to be done the right way. There has to be a lawful assembly. So you get the idea of what the word means. It's not just, you know, some haphazard, let's just, let's just get together and do something type of mentality. It was, a, it was a word that was used to talk about an organized assembly that had a very specific purpose and it, it had to be lawful. In other words, the, per, the people that actually participated had to be a part of that place. And so this was the early first century, and that's how the word was used. So when Jesus pulls this word up and said, and this is, again, we start at Matthew chapter 16 because that's the first time the term is used, and Jesus uses it, and he introduces this concept to his disciples, and it was, it was like, this is going to be my assembly, my church. And, and so this is, this is how this term was introduced to us. Now, you know, the term is going to be used all throughout the Bible. Um, you know, Luke's going to use it um, um, in the book of Acts. You'll see it many times. I'm just, I'm just reading. You know, please, you know, we're not going to have time to turn there. Uh, Paul, um, he said, uh, Acts 11, 26, and when he had found them, the brethren of Antioch, he came to pass that the whole year he assembled with the church. And that's talking about Paul assembling with the church. And this is, Luke is recording this. Luke uh, records again, Acts chapter 13, uh, there that early church in, in, uh, in Antioch, and he writes this in Acts 13, 1. Um, now there were at the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, and he goes through this great list, and Barnabas and Simon that is called Niger, and Lucian of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And so he's, you know, we see this term being used. It's going to be used, of course, for the assembly there at Jerusalem, but then it's, it, that term church is going to be used for the, the, this assembly that, that is there at Antioch. And so it's not like, a, they're not going to use a different term now. They're going to use the same term all throughout, again, the book of Acts and then in the epistles. And for instance, um, um, uh, Paul, he uses the, the term often in his epistles 
because they're church epistles. You're writing the churches. And so you'll see, for instance, I'm just reading from, uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. And so this is Paul's introductions to many of his epistles start with this. Now, for instance, Galatia, the, the, the book, of, uh, book of, of Galatians, Galatia is not a, not a city, it's a region. And, and so that's why he says this. I'm reading from Galatians chapter 1, verse number 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle, not of man, uh, neither by man, but, of, uh, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who hath raised him from the dead, to all the brethren which are with me unto the churches, plural, churches of Galatia. So Galatia is a region, so there are many churches that are scattered throughout there. So you'll see the term used gobs of times throughout the, uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the, um, throughout the Bible. And, and so, you know, ecclesia is translated churches, and, it's, and it will be used, um, it was used in the first century. Now, I, I, I know I had a spot down there, and it says uh, the idea is, um, it, it's a physical, if you would please, a physical assembly of people, okay? It's a physical assembly of people called out. It's a physical assembly. It requires legitimacy. And, and again, that, that, you know, the town clerk said, we, you need to have a legal assembly uh, because what they were doing was not right. It was just a, I mean, a, a riot of people getting together, having an uproar and shouting and screaming. And they said, that's not what, an, that's not what this assembly is. So it's got to be lawful. We need a lawful assembly. So there's got to be some legitimacy to it, okay? That, um, that word lawful, um, it means, uh, the word itself that's used in the Scripture means within the bounds of the law, within the bounds of the law. In other words, there is an established, um, an established criteria that has to be applied. That's why the town clerk uses that term lawful. There's an you know, established criteria. And um, when you have this assembly, there's, there's purpose to it. So this is what the town, again, first century, this is how they understood the term. When, when the, you know, the term is now being used um, by, the, you know, by, by Christ himself, but then by uh, the apostles and by, uh, and by you know, Luke as he's writing the book of Acts, you know, they're using this term and they understood that you know, this is what the term meant. So when they assembled, when, you know, when, when uh, in, they're in that Greek world, every town had an assembly. They had a, they had a reason for it. What's the purpose? Why are we meeting today? And, and so this is the word that Jesus selected to refer to his assembly. It was a very common word throughout, throughout Israel, where they were living at, of course, uh, and throughout the rest of the Roman world. So, I, I, I had to make notice. If you'll notice on the back side there, I have this kind of question here. Did Jesus, um, Jesus did not use the Jewish word synagogue. So I asked, like, why not? Because that would have been an extremely familiar term amongst the Jews in Israel. Synagogue. Um, and that's how they met. They met in synagogues. Um, the synagogue system is not established actually in the Old Testament. It's not, a, it's not established underneath the law. It, it was more of, um, the, the way that I view it, it was more of a practical need, especially during um, this dispersion of the Jews all throughout the world. Uh, when they were in captivity in Babylon, even during the Assyrian captivity, there, there was this, they were away from the temple. There was a necessity of teaching. You will find terms like teaching priests um, and, or teaching scribes uh, mentioned during this period of time. And so there were folks that were actually going out to where the people were. They were assembling them together, and they were teaching them. The word synagogue uh, was often... Uh, is, is found then. So it, it kind of, you don't see it in the Old Testament. It shows up in the New Testament. It happened during that intertestimonial period uh, where these groups of folks were starting to get together and, and assembling Jewish folks. And so, you know, there's no explanation in the Bible why Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church instead of saying, upon this rock, I'm going to build my synagogue. Uh, my own humble opinion about this one uh, is, first of all, to make a distinction between the old and the new. 
And the old, of course, would be the synagogue. It's, you know, it's kind of like the, the new wine and old bottle type of thing that the Bible mentions about in Luke chapter 5. And so you know, God is starting something new, and so he's not going to use an old system, the synagogue system. He is going to use this new system, uh, which is, uh, of course, the, the, the church, the ecclesia. And again, my opinion, because the Bible doesn't say why this is, but in my opinion, I also believe that because uh, the, the, the church, okay, did the church start as a Jewish church? Dina says yes. You're right. It was like 99.9%, like ivory soap. It was all Jewish, okay? Was the intention for it to be and remain a Jewish church? The Great Commission was to go out into all the world, right? The uttermost parts. So if you're going to go to the uttermost parts, it's not going to be a Jewish church very long. So if you start off with a, with a Jewish assembly, okay, synagogue, um, you're going to get to this point where folks are looking around going, what are we doing here? <laughs> we're, we're not. We're not Jews. Um, the... Um, this was a gigantic issue in the first century. Um, the big question, do you have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian? Think about it. Um, that was a big controversy. Uh, the, 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 there were folks coming from Jerusalem heading up to the church in Antioch, right? And what were they doing? They were saying, hey, you know, you got to get circumcised. You got to follow the, the, the law in order to be... And, Paul and Barnabas, they had just come back from these, this great missions trip and saw Gentiles getting saved. Peter, with his, you know, of the events that took place in his life um, and what he saw, um, you know, like, you know, the, 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 um, the soldier Cornelius said he had a chance to, to win to Christ. These guys are going, whoa, put the brakes on right now. This is not the way it's going to work. They had a big council down in Jerusalem to talk about this matter because it was not going to be a Jewish church. And it, they didn't want that. So the use of the word synagogue would have lent right into that way of teaching and that philosophy of trying to maintain the Jewishness uh, of the early church. And that was not Christ's intent. And that certainly was not the intent of those that were actually going out and preaching and seeing Gentiles saved. They understood that this was a, this was a brand new thing. And, and so, so we, we don't see that term synagogue being brought into the early church at all. And so this, this whole idea of the, you know, these folks from the uttermost parts, um, you know, God is going to call out um, from the Gentiles and not just from the Jews. As a matter of fact, again, this is my opinion. I think the Word of God would express this also. The early persecutions that, that came to the churches, to the church in Jerusalem, I truly believe was a result of the fact that they did not start going out like they should have. And so the early persecutions spurred by um, Saul of Tarsus, who would be Paul the Apostle, what it did was it scattered the church and then the evangelism, the uttermost parts, began at that point. So this, in, this calling together of an assembly among the Gentiles did not need to carry, uh, carry with it you know, some kind of badge that says synagogue on it. It was a brand new thing, ecclesia. And so the uh, folks in the uttermost parts, they would have understood ecclesia far more than they would have understood synagogue. And so, so we see that. So where did the word church actually come from? We use it all the time, of course. I want you to notice, uh, uh, um, this is a, um, that, that verse, uh, Matthew 16, 18. This is from Tyndale's Bible. Um, we talked about translations of the Bible, oh, I don't know, months and months and months ago. And so the English, uh, you know, um, the, the translation of the Bible in English, of course, cost a lot of people their lives because the Catholic Church did not want the Bible translated into some kind of vulgar language like English. They wanted to keep it in the Latin Vulgate, and uh, most people, of course, could not read it even at that point. And so um, a lot of these guys like Tyndale and Wycliffe and others gave their lives um, for giving us English Bibles. So Tyndale would have predated the King James Bible that we use today. 
And um, this is how that verse was translated by Tyndale. And I just love the uh, early English writing because that's basically how I spell things right there. Spelling is not my forte. And so you'll notice that uh, upon, um, upon this rock I will build my congregation. So Tyndale used the word congregation throughout his text instead of the word church. He used congregation. Uh, so, and rightfully so. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about, a congregation, people getting together. And so, um, so that's, that's the term. William Tyndale, um, he translated the Greek uh, into the, uh, of the New Testament into English. That's well before the King James. Tyndale was, um, he was strangled and burnt at the stake for translating the New Testament into English. In his work, it is said, uh, was followed at least 90 90 percent by the uh, by the translators, the King James translators. So they took a big chunk of what Tyndale's work was, and then brought it into, of course, their um, their translation, the King James 1611 Bible. And so uh, Tyndale he used congregation instead of church. Tyndale only used the word church once. Um, that it um, excuse me, uh, Tyndale only. I'm I'm reading someone else's quote here. Tyndale only used the word church once, and that was because the text refers to heathen people, okay? So he actually used, back in Acts chapter 19, where we were reading about the assembly, he actually used the word church then instead of assembly, like the King James. King James kind of flipped it, okay? He used the word church in Acts chapter 19, where we see the word assembly, okay? You got it? All right? So um, etymology Always love etymologies, and uh, I'm I'm just getting this right from I forget the uh, the um, uh, the dictionary I used to get this one. I apologize. I should have put a footnote. But uh, the etymology of the word church itself is an old English uh, word, and you'll see the the old English written down there. Uh, it's related to the Dutch word kirk, uh, the German word kirk. Um, so, for instance, if you go over, uh, you know, John and Chris lived in Scotland for many years, and you go to many towns there, like. Kirkcaldy, okay? You'll see a lot of towns with the word Kirk in front of it, and uh, they're in Scotland, and so hence church, okay? So uh, a Kirk is a church uh, over there in the UK. Um, so you see uh, the Greek, um, you see, based on the medieval tests, and, and you'll just, by etymology, what they're doing is they're tracing words back from their original origin and then working their way up of how it's developed in certain languages and where we get it from. So most people conclude the word church that we use today comes from the word kirk, and the word kirk is a, more of a German word than anything. And, but they, they're saying that the root of it goes back to a Greek word, and that's uh, the Greek word is uh, we would use, um, we'd see many times in the, in the New Testament the word Lord in the New Testament, and that comes from the Greek word koreos, and they're saying that this, this German word kirk goes back to this word Lord and the idea of being the Lord's house. And so that's the, the word church itself would then, by etymology, say it goes back to this idea, it's the Lord's house. And so, very very well said, okay? And so, um, basically, that's the word that we use today. And so, in 1611, when the folks are translating the King James Bible, they chose that word church, or kirk, uh, that they would have been very familiar with. Now, it's, um, you know, um, there are some that think that the authors, uh, translators of the King James Bible had, had more of a you know, nefarious reason for that word church, that it was a, more of a political decision uh, than anything. Because please do remember that you know, 1611 England, Protestantism and the Catholic Church, I mean, they were battling, they were butchering each other for control of England and Scotland. And so... Um, you know, when, when Protestantism is uh, now, you know, on the throne and taking possession of things, and they're having this, this Bible now translated to have more of a universal um, availability of a particular text throughout all the churches, uh, and they, they were, uh, there are those that hold to the fact that the King James translators were more politically oriented in their translation by choosing the word church because it's easy, when, when you believe in a universal, invisible, or universal, visible church, 
uh, it's easier to use the word church because it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's more, um, uh, it, it expresses the idea without saying that it's an individual assembly of people. Because you call it congregation or you call it an assembly, you're really defining a group as compared to saying church. <laughs> church is kind of a, you, you, it's kind of one of those words you can kind of make it mean whatever you want it to mean, right? That's exactly what happens today. People just make it mean whatever they want it to mean. Church. It's hard to do that when you say congregation, because you say congregation, that's us, okay? So there are theo that hold it. And of course, another word, there's another word, of course, that the King James uh, Bible uses, the word baptize, baptizo. It's a, it's a transliteration. And many of these early translations, like Tind- I'm not sure how Tyndale translated, I should have looked that up, but some of these early English translations, they use the word immerse. So if you say immerse, there's no confusion, putting people under water, right? Immerse as compared to like sprinkling, okay? Because that's how, you know, the, that's how the Roman Catholics did it. Many of the Protestant churches still today, they sprinkle, okay? Or, okay? And they call it baptism. Well, you know, sprinkling or pouring water over top of somebody does not, does not even begin to understand the definition of the word baptizo, which means immerse, <laughs> okay? So, so here you have this word baptize, and so it's one of the, what, what does baptize mean to you, okay? Uh, and so there's a lot of folks that hold to this, like this nefarious purpose of the tra- King James translator. Now, I mean, so, myself personally, no, I, I have no problem with the word, as long as you define your terms, Okay? And so I don't think they had a nefarious purpose. I don't think they were, you know, malicious uh, or political in their translations at all. I believe they simply used the words that were commonly used at that day that people understood what they meant. So when people said church, they're talking about an assembly of believers, right? And when people used the term baptize, they understood that's what the word means. It means to immerse. And, And so... You know, as long as, as long as you're willing to do the homework and look at the words and understand definitions, uh, you're, you're, you will fall in the right place doctrinally. But when you, when you begin to say, well, you know, it can mean whatever you want it to mean to you, then your doctrine is going to be so skewed, it, will go every, it goes in every direction possible. And, and so... A word like the word church, as long as it's defined, can give us some good direction about what actually is the nature of this assembly that Jesus Christ had called together. Now, I want to I end with this. Uh, since the word church is referred to a people being called out for the purpose of assembling together, when exactly was this called out assembly first called out? And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Because this is, this is one of those things, Okay. I learned something completely different before I understood what the nature of the church was. So we're going to talk about that because when the church started really affects a lot of doctrine. And so um, come on back next week. We're going to talk about when the assembly was called out and understanding when it was called out. How does it affect what we believe and what we practice as one of the Lord's churches? Lord bless you. Thanks for being in Sunday school today.